Okay. All right. Let me I just... need to win. And here. And okay. So there's things. Um, yeah. Recording. Um, okay. I think we're good to yeah. go. Go ahead. Mm. Okay, so uh, welcome to the uh, webinar. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are connecting from. Uh, I hope you are able to hear us clearly. Uh, if you have uh, problems or issues hearing us, please uh, send us a chat uh, message and then We'll try to see if we can address it. Uh, and the presentation also will be um, on the screen. So if you again, if if you are not able to see uh, the presentation uh, slides, uh, please let us know. Uh, just let me quickly uh, give a brief uh, background of this uh, webinar. Um, this webinar is uh, being organized uh, as a part of the, um, the hands-on training workshop, which will happen later in the uh, next month. Uh, and both this workshop and webinar, it's being organized under the uh, work program of the consultative group of experts. Um, the consultative group of experts uh, when it was formulating its work uh, plan for uh, this year, um, wanted to uh, focus on um, data issue, um, basically institutionalizing data management in your institutional arrangements. And that was in response to the, uh, the findings, uh, that um, findings out of the uh, needs assessment, uh, capacity building needs assessment. Uh, in general, uh, during the uh, assessment process, um, there were two messages that came out quite uh, clearly uh, relating to, and both were uh, in relation to data um, uh, data issue. The first um, issue was really um, there is uh, there is this sense that uh, there is a lot of issues around primary data collection. And that issue uh, seems to manifest in uh, multiple uh, ways. For example, lack of uh, access to data has been uh, has come out has come out as one of the issues. The other one, again relating to primary data itself, is uh, the um, unavailability of data itself. And and thirdly, uh, in in some cases, uh, yes, there is data, but the data. Um, is either not in a proper format or, or there are some quality issues. And then second kind of uh, issue relating to data seems to be uh, around uh, management itself. Either there is lack of uh, human resource, human uh, resource capacity uh, or technical infrastructure uh, that, that can support uh, data management. So given those, um, those issues that uh, seem to be in, in most of the countries, CGE wanted to really focus uh, its capacity building uh, technical assistance uh, activities on this uh, data, data this thing. So as a result of that, uh, we have put together a program which now includes um, webinar and part of this, the webinar will provide scene for the in-session, uh, uh, in-person uh, workshop. So this webinar is actually very much part of the, uh, uh, the workshop and that's why we, in the invitation letters, uh, we had clearly indicated that uh, it would be uh, necessary for all registered nominate, nominated participants to go through this. So let me, uh, without uh, spending too much time on this, let me uh, go into the uh, the uh, agen agenda for today. Um, in this webinar, uh, we will um, we will address this in three parts. The first part will be around uh, the UNFCCC process, uh, where um, there will be a presentation um, on 
what are the existing uh, MRV uh, arrangements in place and what can you expect from enhanced transparency framework. And then we will also provide a snapshot of how the, the uh, Latin America as a region is doing in terms of uh, the existing MRV arrangements and what are some of the key, um, key um, or uh, key activities or capacity building um, initiatives that, that you can um, see that is being uh, rolled out or being planned uh, at this point of time. Uh, and then after that, uh, we, after the presentation, we will have a short uh, Q&A session. And then after that, we will move into the technical part of the uh, webinar, which, which will be on uh, introduction to greenhouse gas inventories, uh, and then um, what uh, what does it mean in terms of data uh, when you talk of uh, inventories. So for these two parts of technical sessions, we have a very, um, um, we have two esteemed uh, colleagues uh, here as a resource person. The first part will be taken, part, taken up by uh, Mr. Uh, Canel uh, Deluska. He is a sitting CG member from Haiti. Um, just to briefly give, uh, introduce him, uh, Kenel, he is from Haiti. He is agricultural engineer by training. training. He holds a PhD in uh, physical geography from uh, Montreal University. And he is one of the lead authors, uh, authors of the IPCC special report on climate change land. He has more than 10 years of experience in conducting inventory. Uh, and then the second part of the uh, the technical part of this webinar will be taken up by uh, Dr. Michael Gillen Water. I think most of you uh, he uh, most of you um, might be uh, knowing him. He is the executive director and co-founder of the uh, Greenhouse Gas Management Institute. He is also one of the uh, lead authors. Um, IPCC lead authors and contributor uh, to its 2007 Nobel uh, Peace Prize. Uh, and he is uh, also a very internationally recognized expert and instructor of, uh, on uh, greenhouse gas MRV uh, issues. So we are very much um, uh, happy, uh, honored to have uh, two uh, really uh, practitioners or experts in the field to take us through these two sessions. And then finally, I will, um, before we close this session, I will give a quick um, um, snapshot of what you can expect to see in the uh, three days uh, hands-on workshop. So with that, uh, just for your information, we have uh, also circulated this PowerPoint uh, presentations in Spanish. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, because of the technology, we were not able to put in this uh, uh, concurrent uh, translation uh, facilities. But for the uh, workshop, uh, in-person workshop, we will have that Spanish-English uh, translation services. Uh, for the Q&A, if you prefer, you can also address your questions in, in uh, Spanish. Uh, we have a colleague here who, uh, who can uh, help us with the uh, translation. Uh, for the uh, Q&A part, uh, question part, uh, please send us your questions through chat function. Uh, that is more uh, uh, efficient and manageable uh, given the infrastructure. So with that, uh, may I invite uh, Kenel to um, take us through the first part of the uh, session, today's session. Kenel. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jigme. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, all. So uh, it's my pleasure to be part of this uh, webinar of the CG on the topic mentioned by Jigna uh, in the uh, introductory speech. Uh, so to start, uh, the first slide that
Yeah, uh, to start with the, let's recall the existing MRV arrangement on the, for developing countries under the, the convention. So to facilitate a good understanding of uh, the existing MRV arrangement, we can group them in uh, several uh, categories. At the international level, and according to uh, several COP decisions, as you can see on the screen, we have the NATCOM, the National Communication, we have the BUAS, and we also have the ICA. Uh, so uh, for the NAT, for the NATCOM, we have here uh, several key aspects uh, that are part of the uh, NATCOM. We have the GHG emission and tanks. We also have steps to implement convention. With respect to viewers, so the key elements are GHG inventory report. Uh, we have also to report mitigation action and the effects. We have to report on domestic MRV system and also on need and support received. For the ICA, ICA uh, stands for International Consultation Analysis. So those are technical analysis of the VUI and also uh, FSV, Facilitative Sharing of View. Uh, this is at the international uh, level. At the domestic level, uh, uh, the developing countries are, have to make arrangements for domestic MRV to Support uh, to uh, of domestically supported NAMAN. This is a voluntary uh, uh, element of the uh, domestic uh, level. Uh, we have also to report on domestic MRV in the BUR. Uh, those are for the uh, domestic uh, level. And um, those provisions came from uh, decision 21, uh, CP19. Uh, on a voluntary basis, we can also have um, uh, MRV for Red Cross that will fit in into the BUR. Next, please. Next slide, please. Okay. So, um, now let's give uh, a quick reminder of the broad elements of the PA, of the Paris Agreement. So, as you can see on the screen, the objective, the main objective of the Paris Agreement is to strengthen the global response to the threat of climate change. And to achieve this objective, the Paris Agreement has considered three main goals. The first one is the long-term temperature goal, the two uh, degrees C or uh, 1.5 degrees C. Uh, the second one deal with uh, climate resilience and low emission development. And the third goal, the third goal has to see with uh, the financial, the financial flows. In terms of strategy to achieve those objectives and those goals, the Paris Agreement consider both actions and means of implementation. In terms of action, broadly speaking, there are adaptation action and mitigation action. Regarding, regarding means of implementation, there are finance, technology development and transfer, and also capacity building. The Paris Agreement also has also provisions related to accountability at both individual and aggregate level. The uh, accountability within the Paris Agreement is made of transparency of action and support, 
the GSC, the global stock test. This can be seen as uh, his ambition mechanism. And the third aspect of the accountability component of the Paris Agreement is uh, the facilitation of implementation and compliance. Next, please. Next slide, please. Can we, move, can we move to the next slide, please? What's that? So uh, this slide gives a good overview of the ambition mechanism under the Paris Agreement. So at the center of this mechanism, there's the GSC, the Global Stock Tech. And this Global Stock Tech is fitted by the enhanced transparency format and also the implementation and compliance mechanism. So with the global stock tech that is fitted by the ETF and the implementation and compliance, so those two elements will give us uh, the provision or the element to enhance our ambition in terms of action, ambition in terms of action, and ambition in terms of means of implementation. So this is a very uh, broad uh, overview of the ambition mechanism. Uh, we have to remind uh, the GSC at the center of this mechanism. Next slide, please. So uh, now let's see how we're going to move from the existing MRV arrangement to the ETF, to the NN Transparency Framework. So uh, what we have to uh, have in mind here is uh, that both the developed country parties and developed in country parties has to uh, submit either the BUR for the developing countries no later than uh, December 2022. So both the developed country and the developing countries have to submit the last document BUR for the developing countries, BR for the uh, developed countries by December 2022. Uh, uh, after this date, so all parties mm, will have to submit the first by annual transparency report, the BTR. And immediately after the submission of the uh, first BTR, the TR has to be initiated. TR is for the uh, technical expert review. And also we have the MCP that needs to follow as soon as possible the publication of the CER report. So uh, we have to uh, highlight that there's some flexibility. Uh, for example, for the first BTR, there's some flexibility for the SHIFT and the LDC. And um, this uh, flexibility uh, will be uh, determined by the capacity of, uh, of those countries. So there are some flexibility for the fit and the LDC. And uh, well, so what to uh, remind is by 2022, this is on the last year for the submission of the BR for the developed country and the BUR for the 
a developing country. After that, so all parties have to submit uh, the first DPR with some flexibility for the S for the CIS and for the LDC. Next slide, please. Next, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so now we're going to present some. Uh, comparison of the ETF vis-a-vis uh, -vis the existing MRV arrangement. So here, we, uh, the, what we provide here is not exhaustive. This is a, a set of uh, examples of significant change for developing countries. So you, you will see some uh, significant changes indicated in red uh, in the slide. So for national GIG inventory, so we will be uh, using so all the developing country, all the parties will have to use uh, the 2006 IPCC guideline. Uh, now, uh, the main change uh, for the last inventory year so the last inventory year has to be uh, no more than two or three years for the to the submission. Three years is a uh, flexibility for the developing country. So, uh, uh, and the country has uh, to show, uh, has to meet some criteria to be able to show those, uh, to be able to take, to take benefit of those out of this flexibility. And uh, also in terms of time series, so, uh we have to uh the country need to con to consider the annual time series starting from 1990 uh with a flexibility for some country to provide to uh take into consideration the ndc uh, reference uh, year of period uh mentioned and um Another significant change is uh, the gases. So there are former gases that have been added to the uh, the three uh, the three uh, main gases: uh, methane and, and uh, nitrous oxide. So in order for a country to be able to take benefit of this flexibility, so there are two main criteria to be met. First, uh, for example, for the uh, uh, the first criteria is that the the gases uh, are not uh, have not been reported uh, previously. This is the first criteria. The second one is uh, that uh, the changes mentioned have not been uh, covered or integrated are not being taken into account into article six or the activity to be on that again are not taken into account by article six of the price argument and also the uh there's another criteria so that uh the element is not covered by the ndc so those are the two criteria that the country needs to be to, to uh to respect in order to 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 be able to take benefit of the of the of flexibility that uh, uh, the ETF offers to the company. Next slide, please. So uh, there, there's no uh, uh, the uh, in the ETF. So we'll uh, still have to report on climate change impact and adaptation and. Uh, for example, information on loss and damage. So, uh, country will need to report on those information under the ETF. Uh, in terms in term of support needed and received, so uh, there's also uh, qualitative and quanti quantitative information to be reported under the support needed and received. And also, 
uh, for this, we have to provide more clarity uh, uh, and more granular information with respect to support needed and receive it. Next slide, please. So following with the um, comparison of the main, uh, the significant changes uh, under the ETF. So for the technical expert review, uh, one key element to mention is uh, that the first BTR, the first general transparency report, uh, will be uh, undergo and in country or centralized review. So the centralized review is a uh, uh, flexibility for some uh, developing country. Uh, and the technical expert review introduced also a concept of simplified review. In terms of the MCD, the facilitative multilateral consideration of view, uh, there's effort on the article nine and the respective implementation and achievement of NDC. Uh, and uh, will take place uh, as soon as possible the publication of TR report, but there are two exceptions. If the TR report does not become available within 12 months of the video submission, and if a party does not submit a BTR within 12 months uh, from uh, December 21st of 2024. Those are the two exceptions uh, for the FMCD. Uh, Next, please. So as uh, Jitme mentioned in his introduction, so uh, now we will provide some uh, snapshots on on the region uh, in terms of uh, uh, national communication and go and other uh, 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 transparency uh, uh, documents. So here we have a, a graph that show uh, uh, the situation for the NATCOM for the national communication and uh, uh, for uh, the VUA in terms of submission. Uh, as we can see, the LAT region is performed uh, fairly well uh, for both the NATCOM and the VUA, but there's still uh, a lot of effort to do in terms of uh, submission of uh, VUA. Uh, in terms this graph show uh, the uh, yeah we can do, we can go to the next one. I just highlight the uh, um, performance of the rock region for the NATCOM national communication and for the ABUA. Uh, the present graph show uh, mainly uh, uh, information and UA and CSRR. So, and FSV also. Uh, so once again, the LAC region is performing uh, very well, but we still uh, have a lot of effort to do in terms of VUA. Next slide, please. Okay, these are uh, uh, slides show the latest GHG inventory uh, that have been uh, submitted by the uh, LAC uh, region, by LAC country. Uh, for example, in 2006, uh, there's only one uh, GAG inventory submitted by, by, by the country within the region. So those, uh, this will give you a very uh, good overview of the evolution of the submission of uh, GIG inventory within, within the region. Next, please. 
these uh, pie chart uh, present the number of Latin American and Caribbean countries per key category reported in the latest DAG inventory report. Uh, so, uh, as uh, we can see, the energy sector and uh, the LUCF, the land use and uh, sector, and also um, the, yes, those two sectors are usually and uh, represented within uh, the DSG inventory report of the country uh, of the region, uh, the energy sector and the LUCF, uh, uh, the land use chain and forestry sector. Um, on the lesser extent, we have the some industrial processes that have been reported also uh, by the country within the region. Uh, and also agriculture remain one of the key uh, category uh, reported uh, in the GIG inventory uh, of the country of the region. Next slide, please. So these are uh, uh, those. No, can we, can we go back to the previous one? Yes, yeah, thanks. Those uh, pie charts uh, provide some example of the key uh, uh, category reported uh, uh, by some country. We have example from Antigua and Barbuda, Bol Bolivia, uh, Mexico, and Paraguay. So what we can uh, reveal here is uh, the fact that the energy sector remain one of the key sector uh, 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 reported in the uh, GAG inventory. Uh, within the region. We also have the LULUCF sector. So those are the two sectors that are mainly uh, reported and represented uh, within the GAG inventory of the country uh, within the LAC uh, region. Uh, there are uh, some uh, slight uh, differences in terms of proportion, but uh, they remain the key uh, emission sector and the key uh, reported sector within uh, uh, the GSG inventory of the country of the region. Next, please. Next, please. So uh, this uh, table give uh, a quick overview about overview of the um, capacity building effort that have been undertaken in the region in uh, 2019. So we have a list of activities that have uh, that have been uh, that have already uh, realized in uh, in the region. So uh, in different in different part of the region. So we have a list of uh, the different events even here in the in the table and also the month of the realization of those events. Uh, so uh, I recall or uh, I take the benefit to recall the CGE and on training workshop on institutionalization of data management for GAG for the Latin LAC region that will be held in uh, July in Berlin City. And also um, there's a, a event on monitoreo y evaluación de la adaptación al cambio climático uh, this event will be held in Colombia in July. And also there are some events uh, that will be held in August and uh, in Costa Rica and in Jamaica. Uh, and also another event in November of this year in Guyana uh, uh, that will be organized by the GSP. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, uh, through the Paris spirit, the ETF, the Enhanced Transparency Framework, build and enhance the existing MRV arrangement. So we saw how we can move uh, from the 
existing MRV arrangement to the new ETF under the Paris Agreement. So uh, the ETF uh, will build on the what exists and try to uh, enhance. The existing MRV arrangement provides perfect opportunity for parties to do what we call a dry one of the ETF and encourage parties to continue preparing DUAs and participating in the international consultation and analysis process. And uh, there's a need to have a focus on enhancing the institutional arrangement. And to do so, the requirement stemming from that needs to be kept fully uh, in mind. So there are, there are a number of success stories to draw inspiration from. And last but not least, ownership, domestic political buying, access to support, will continue to be essential elements for a successful implementation of the ETF. So this is all I have to say, and I thank you for your attention. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kenel. Uh, now, um, as announced by chat, if you have uh, any questions, please let us know. Uh, and my my suggestion would be we take up three questions now and then move to next presentation. And then after that, if uh, we have more questions, we can uh, take up again uh, after the uh, second uh, presentation. We do have one questions, uh, one question here. Uh, let me see if I understood this question correctly. Uh, basically, it was on figure slide number six. Um, so the question is: those countries that require flexibility. Uh, do we need to submit BTR by 2025? Uh, that is accompanied by financial technical uh, assistance. I hope uh, I'm getting your uh, essence of your question right. Uh, my my understanding is of your question is whether those countries that need uh, flexibility in the light of their capacity, whether they would be obligated to submit the first BTRs by 2025. Uh, so that's the only question that we have now. Uh, Kenel, do, do you want to address this? Uh, uh, yes, I can say uh, uh, I can put some uh, elements uh, on this matter, and if the secretary wants to add something, so feel free to do so. Uh, so, for those countries uh, uh, that need flexibility, for example, uh, the SID and the LDT, so uh, they can submit uh, the first uh, BTR after after twenty uh, uh, twenty uh, twenty after twenty twenty. Uh, uh, but so this is what the, flex, uh, the, the flexibility is. So uh, they, uh, the flexibility uh, uh, gives them uh, a level of margin, so they don't have to uh, to uh, respect uh, the common uh, deadline 20, uh, 20, 25. So uh, yes, those countries that need flexibility can submit the first BTR after 2025. So, Jigmin, I don't know if you want to add something? Uh, yes. Uh, well, in terms of this uh, flexibility, uh, it is applied at the provision level instead of at the systemic level. So, apart from SIDS and LDCs, rest of the parties will have to will be obligated to submit their first BTR by 
December 2024. As you submit your BTR, the application of flexibility will be within the uh, report on different parts of, uh, depending on the different parts. And Kamil had already, uh, Kanal had already, sorry, uh, went through some of the examples here. Um, SIDS and LDCs, um, that deadline does not, uh, is not a hard one for SIDS and LDCs. Uh, for SIDS and LDCs, uh, they can submit uh, after 31st December 2024, uh, but as they, uh, if they decide to submit BTR, then the rest of the, um, the MPGs will apply um, to them as well. Uh, I, I think there was one more popped up. So there was one more question. Give us a second uh, to get this. So that wasn't a substantive one. Uh, we, after we circulated the presentation to you uh, over the course of uh, yesterday evening and this morning, we updated uh, numbers in few slides. So we will share with you this updated uh, presentation that you just saw. Uh, uh, we'll circulate this to you after the webinar. Okay, so let's now move to second part of the uh, presentation. Um, thank you so much, uh, very much, uh, Kanel, for uh, for the presentation. May I now invite uh, Michael? Okay. Yes, hello. Thank you, Jigme. Um, uh, maybe just a confirmation, Jigme, that you can hear me. <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Good, wonderful. I just wanted to be sure I didn't start a long monologue with, with no one listening. Uh, um, again, uh, uh, welcome everyone um, and, and buenos dias uh, and, and appreciate your uh, endurance um, during this webinar session. Um, hopefully hopefully it, is, it, it, is, it has been useful and will we'll, we'll be further useful here in a second. Um, so, uh, and also just wanted to say uh, our faculty at uh, the GCC Management Institute is looking forward to seeing all of you in Belize uh, uh, soon. So, um, you've, you've now heard, uh, uh, you know, the, um, how would you say, the, the formal details on the Enhanced Transparency Framework um, and, the, uh, and using kind of the uh, UNFCCC um, language. I'm going to try and step back and um, uh, be, uh, uh, I guess, a little more uh, hands-on, uh, practical, and, and, and step through uh, uh, MRV systems um, and specifically the data-related issues around MRV systems with a, with a primary focus on greenhouse gas inventories. So just, uh, let's first just uh, get through some, some definitions here uh, on, on MRV um, uh, um, um, systems. And um, uh, first thing is obviously this is just defined MRV, you know, measurement and monitoring. Um, we can, you know, measure and monitor with respect to climate change, a lot of different things. Obviously greenhouse gas emissions, um, it's a key thing we're gonna be talking about here. Um, but there's also, which is highly relevant within the Paris Agreement framework, um, um, measuring the um, actions and the impact of those actions on mitigation. Um, obviously, a, a, a lot of work still to be done on, in terms of how to, to, to measure the, the impacts of climate change itself and then, the, and, and then our adaptation measures to address them um, and then support. You know, this is the, this is the you know, enhanced transparency framework breakdown. Next slide. So, and then, you know, obviously reporting has a lot of purposes. You know, the key thing is for the, all this data is to help, help make decisions, um, but it's also um, obviously provide transparency. Um, and um, key amongst them, 
um, is to evaluate the effectiveness for, for countries to evaluate their own effectiveness um, with respect to their policies and for the international community to, to, to raise ambition and to, to, you know, ensure that we're all contributing, you know, to help address the challenge of climate change. Um, and there's also obviously political dimensions there in terms of how we clearly communicate to um, our um, stakeholders and public about what is going on and, and both in terms of actions that um, governments are taking and the, the results of those actions. Next slide. Verification. Um, you know, it has a, a lot of different terms in different contexts. Um, the IPCC guidelines has one particular term with it, with respect to greenhouse gas inventories. Um, um, many of you are probably familiar with the use of the term within the context of uh, carbon markets. Um, but um, the, the common denominator is that we want some sort of independent assessment that creates accountability and, and, and gives quality assurance. Um, in this case, um, you know, you want to further build build trust. Transparency does one thing, but verification, you know, is is a, is, a, is another step in that process of of building trust. Um, but it also is a way of engaging, you know, other other stakeholders in, in the process, um, potentially other data suppliers, other analysts, um, um, to 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 kind of just like you would in any scientific process, you want to go through and. You know, see if you get the same results doing doing the, doing the estimates in different ways. Next slide. So this is the framework we already heard heard about it briefly with respect to the um, ETF enhanced transparency framework of the, the kind of three uh, baskets of MRV related uh, um, pieces of the of, of the um, uh, data management on greenhouse gas emissions obviously, um, which relate to both uh, inventories and, you know, mitigation tracking, um, the finance support and adaptation. Um, obviously, we're going to focus here primarily on the greenhouse gas uh, piece of this three uh, leg stool. Next slide. So we can break down that greenhouse gas um, uh, leg of the stool even further. Um, there are national emission inventories and, and removal um, um, estimates, um, and those are what you know we all are familiar with from the, the support to national communication, BURs, and, and will soon to be part of the BTR process. Um, and again, that is national in scope. But we also have um, you know greenhouse gas emissions data supporting our tracking. Um, and uh, estimates of mitigation uh, actions and policies. So, you know, for some some of you are familiar with the process of NAMAs um, um, and other kind of policies and measures. NDCs were obviously fall under this this umbrella, um, especially when they're more sectoral. Of you know, drilling down into what is the impact of particular uh, policies and measures, um, and those can act at several different levels. They could be national. They can be subnational or sectoral, they could even be, you know, one major facility or, or a few. Um, and then the other element, um, which can can be separate or can be, you know, uh, uh, integrated in with the national data is facility level data, um, you know, that is part of mandatory reporting rules, uh, missions trading systems, it could be carbon tax or carbon pricing schemes, um, specific regulatory measures that, that address the facility level. Uh, again, this is the this is the realm of often you know regulatory reporting um, and 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 kind of legal compliance issues, um, and that's a whole whole another area of MRV. And then lastly, um, that uh, um, many of you all, again are also probably familiar with is the project level MRV, um, CDM, and and um, also some smaller NAMAs, um, and again that falls with falls into the, the more highly resolved scale of facility and projects. All these, you know, are part of greenhouse gas emissions, MRV, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but we're going to, again, as you can see with the color highlighting, focus on national emissions inventory removal. But it's important to recognize that all these are part 
potentially part of a system and there's interactions between them. Obviously for a national inventory, you may be collecting facility level data um, that could be then useful later on for you know, other policies and measures. Um, so it's, it's as you're going through um, uh, thinking about your reporting and your MRV system, we need to consider all these pieces and you know, what are you gonna prioritize and how the data collection for different parts of your MRV system can help support each other. Next slide. So let's step back a little bit. Um, uh, when we say MRV system and data collection, um, there's lots of different pieces of what we call the MRV system infrastructure. Um, um, the information management tools um, are just one piece of the overall package. Obviously, <clears throat> there's, lot, there's potentially lots of legal and regulatory um, pieces of that, of that overall system. Um, you know, legal support for doing data collection and collecting the statistics from industry um, and, and other regulatory measures. Um, there's scientific knowledge, like we need to have the knowledge to understand where the emissions are coming from and how to estimate them and the methodology for doing that. That's that, that resource for our MRV system, you know, for national inventories is, is largely supplied by the um, IPCC guidelines, but there's obviously also national level, you know, country specific um, emission factors and other things that come into play there that, that require additional scientific knowledge. Um, and then the technolo <coughs> technologies for doing the you know, data collection and measurement flow meters and things like that. Um, technical standards and codes, obviously there's lots of um, information out there and resources out there in terms of um, you know, ISO standards and other things for how you do data collection um, at, at the very detailed levels. You know, how do you measure things um, at coal power plants and um, in terms of the coal, you know, the, the coal consumption and um, you know, there's a whole, so you know, applying those technical standards at that detailed level is important and that's an important resource. Um, you know, reviewers, verifiers, um, uh, you know, accreditation when you're getting into more facility level data or project level data. Um, obviously, all the institutional and management systems. So the, this is the, you know, the agencies, the ministries, the teams, the, the, the technical experts and have, you know, the human resources to do this work is all important. And then the educational resources to, to continually, you know, supply the expertise um, for doing this work. So all these are part of the you know, overall MRV information management system and infrastructure. Um, we're going to focus primarily on the, the, the institutional arrangements um, and the um, information management tools here going forward. But again, you have to keep all these pieces in mind as you're, as you're thinking about your system. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit briefly about uh, design of your MRV system. Um, this, you know, th this um, webinar and uh, the workshop is, is not going to be an, an necessarily a, a complete a complete program on how to design your system. But um, if you're not thinking about um, you know data management in the in the um, kind of broader picture of an overall system design, then you're going to make mistakes and you're going to end up with uh, either software or other tools that in the long run don't actually fit your needs. So the first step um, in doing this is obviously to step back and think about your your data output objective. So like what do you want? What what kind of data do you want? You know, in, out at the end um, for to use. Um, clearly, you know, data for your uh, biennial transparency report is the obvious obvious answer to that. But it's not, it may not be the only answer. Again, looking back at all those other pieces of the MRV puzzle, there could be domestic policies. There could be linkages between emissions data and uh, um, um, for mitigation projects and uh, with uh, other adaptation measures you're taking. Um, there could be, you know, facility level mandatory reporting rules. There could be carbon markets. There could be a whole host of other data um, objectives you have that are related to national inventory data. Um, and so systematically thinking about all of those pieces and how they interconnect um, it is critical from the get-go. So if you if you narrowly say all I need is a BTR and I'm not going to think about anything else, then again you're you're potentially missing, you know, missing some things that in the longer run you're gonna you're gonna wish you had. 
Um, and then you translate that into uh, functional requirements, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, uh, and then even further into specific technical requirements, for example, for a software system or something that you, you need, like what does the software need to do? Um, and then how does that coupled with institutional arrangements, meaning like, you know, a software a software tool sitting on a computer that no one uses doesn't do you any good. So we need to think about, you know, which institutions are going to use that software, where's the data going to come from, who are going to be the, you know, personnel responsible for making sure the system runs, um, and having all those staff do that. Next slide. So let's discuss briefly some thinking about um, the functional requirements and, and, and focusing now on um, inventory data um, because you, the functional requirements could obviously get very lengthy uh, list if we talk about all those different pieces of, of MRV, but uh, although it is important to do that as, as you're being systematic about it. Um, but the different functional requirements, for example, for a data management system, um, obviously you need to collect and aggregate data. You need to store that data, including um, activity data and emission factors and all the other parameters. Um, you need to be a, that, you know, that uh, system also needs to be able to document all the supporting data uh, information that goes along with that data collection. So you don't want just the number. You need where does that number come from, where are its data quality characteristics, you know, to support uncertainty uh, estimation. So sort of basically all the characteristics about that data, you know, for example, the data may be somewhat incomplete, um, and so you need to characterize, you know, what is the incompleteness um, with that data, um, and so that you can deal with it in terms of inventory improvement later on. Um, a data management system may actually do analysis; it may estimate emissions, or that could be done, you know, in some other some other tool or in spreadsheets. Um, you want to document the methodologies you're using um, in the in, in the data management system. Um, this, and then, you know, the next step is, you know, beginning to do QAQC, some of which can be automated, some of which could be manual. Um, um, some some uh, uh, data management systems can also help you generate your reports and start, you know, drafting the text. Uh, not the system drafts the text for you, but it can help make that process easier by linking the, the data with the description of the methodology for how you would process the data and then how you estimated emissions. Um, um, as I'm sure many of you have, have experienced, uh, data security and confidentiality for some industries can be very a very important issue. So uh, a system may need to address those, those provisions in terms of security. Um, you may want to, oh, you know, be able to have a workspace where different, you know, data suppliers and ministries, you know, different sectoral teams can work together and share data. Um, especially, this is important for the inventory compiler, um, who is pulling together estimates from you know, all the different sources and sectors, um, but and potentially working with, you know, um, uh, uh, sector experts or source experts. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, uh, eventually all this needs to be archived. So these are. This, you know, these are the kind of things of you know, stepping through. It's like, what are my functional requirements for, you know, my um, data management system? Next slide. So let's um, drill down into specifically data collection, um, uh, and which is obviously, you know, the, the a critical function. Um, if you don't, you know, none of the, none of this is none of this is really relevant if we're not getting good data, collecting good data in the first place. Um, here's a couple examples of a useful exercise, um, uh, some of which we, we may be doing in the, in the workshop to come um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a practice, but doing a data flow mapping. So there's lots of different kinds of data for lots of different um, source categories and, and removal categories within the, within the inventory. Um, and starting to step through and saying, where is this, you know, where is the raw data coming from and how, what is the flow in terms of where it goes from, you know, the, the, say the companies that, you know, originally supply it to say, you know, a ministry of energy that then, you know, aggregates and processes it and, and then, you know, on to a, uh, the uh, uh, inventory team. And there could be multiple other steps in between there and, and different processing steps. So mapping all that out. Um, um, is a useful exercise to see, you know, 
to you know basically document your institutional arrangements, but also essentially provide you know future um, inventory compilers with sort of you know essentially a map for where the data is going to come from and how it gets to eventually you know the overall inventory. Um, and this is a, an example of one um, uh, uh, I did for the U.S. greenhouse gas inventory uh, years ago um, for, for 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 one sector. Um, and then uh, along with that, obviously, you need the institutional arrangements. So there's where there's the, the, the flow of the actual data, and then there's the, the, the uh, people who are going to, you know, make that flow happen um, and who's going to be in charge of what. And so mapping those institutional arrangements in, in some sort of hierarchy is, is, is also a useful step. Um, next slide. Again, we'll be, th these are the kind of things we'll dive into more deeply in the workshop, but, um, but we wanted to give you a, a kind of a, an example of some of the issues we're gonna be talking about more, you know, there. Um, why is data collection important? I mean, I probably don't even, we probably don't even need this slide, but um, we're gonna you know, make the point uh, anyway, because it's, it's, it's always important. Um, there's different, you know, different pieces um, obviously it's an integral part of developing the inventory um, you need formalized processes you know um, for for collecting data so you need a, like a, a clear process now that now that you know all countries are going to be doing this every two years and it's going to be repeated you know over and over again and it's going to want continuous improvement you know over those two-year cycles um, you need a very you know formalized process that can just continue you know continue um, Essentially, cranking through um, on, a, on a regular basis. Um, IPCC guidelines helps with this a lot, you know, with guidance on how to set up your data collection system. Um, uh, I know it's a it's a little bit it's a little advanced it's a little advanced now because it was just approved by the by the um, IPCC uh, um, plenary. But um, the 2019 refinement to the IPCC guidelines um, has a new chapter on institutional arrangements. Um, and how to think about setting those up and guidance for doing that that can be useful for many, you know, for many countries to look at in terms of thinking through these issues. Um, and I would, I would, uh, you know, encourage people once that's available um, to look at that, that new chapter. Um, and then, uh, you know, as you're collecting data, again, it's important to not just focus on just getting the number, you know, the activity data number or the mission factor. Is that you know there's a whole body of supporting information around that number that characterize the quality of that number and where it came from um, and what things might need to be done to improve it in the future um, that goes goes along with it. Next slide. So what are the key data types? I mean this is you know. Uh, Probably relatively obvious, but it's useful to useful to 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 to, to break it down. Um, obviously, there's the uh, emission estimates, and then what goes into that is you know activity data and emission factors. And really, when we say emission factors, what we really mean is all the different parameters that are applied to activity data. Um, you know, different parameters for you know adjustments and corrections, and um, um, you know there's you know if you look at any method, there's lots of different potential parameters and fa factors that go in, go into estimating emissions. Um, yeah, I'll just, I'll just, uh, next slide. So now this is a graphic of the uh, inventory development process. Um, uh, you know, starting a, you know, it's a cyclical process um, you know, going, you know, you know, under the BTR, so it will be happening every two years. And so oftentimes, you, you know, what you find is you're, you're, you know, pretty quickly after you finish, you know, one inventory, you're starting the next one. Um, um, and, you know, you're repeating that process again, over and over again. Um, so you need a, you know, a, a, a kind of a clear process for kicking off the inventory, you know, bringing the, all the, you know, you know, connecting with all the data suppliers, and all the different, you know, uh, uh, experts that will be working with you on on that, you know, on developing the estimates and writing the report, and you know, saying, you know, starting off that 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 new round, the new cycle, 
um, deciding what you know what sorts of improvements you're going to be making um, for this cycle um, and prioritizing those. Um, and there's data collection, so that's step one. And there's data collection, you know, aspects of each of these steps. Um, identifying your key categories, um, you know, then of course selecting your methods that you're going to apply, and those methods may, again can potentially change over time as you advance from tier one to tier two for some, for especially for key categories. Um, then the obviously collecting the data once you've selected your methods, because you have to know what method you're going to use, um, um, you know, before you before you collect collect your data. Although in practice, sometimes this this step goes in reverse. Sometimes what you do, especially when you're you know doing one of your earlier inventories, is you go see what data is available, and then you figure out what method um, you can use given the data you have that's available. And so it can be somewhat iterative. Um, and then obviously apply that method and estimate emissions, and then perform a certainty analysis and QAQC and other other quality assurance measures. Um, but the yellow arrows are the data collection elements. So you can see there's data collection elements in almost every step. Um, and we're going to focus on those briefly. Next slide. Um, and these are some of the steps I talked about, you know, the before data collect, you know, before we kind of get into data collection, obviously, you know, kicking off that inventory process and, and cycle. Again, there's, there's guidance in the IPCC guidelines on what that starting and kickoff process looks like. And we won't go into here. Um, obviously, also um, guidance on how to do a key category analysis, sometimes of which, you know, you may have to do on some very basic inventory estimates. You know, again, if you're if you're doing an inventory um, for the first time or for the first time in, in you know, in quite some while, um, you can use some basic data to at least preliminarily identify key categories. And then, and then obviously, you know, uh, uh, selecting selecting methods um, itself. Um, next slide. So let's focus a little bit on uh, data collection. Um, obviously, this can um, be the well, you know the most critical and uh, resource demanding, especially when you're building your data collection system. Um, for the you know for the first time and and kind of internalizing that within within you know the government government process so that means not just not just going out and getting the data but it means setting up a system that allows you to repeatedly collect this data again every two years um, or really every year but you know only reporting it every two years um, and setting up that system of kind of clear rules and procedures and you know data supplier agreements and you know, um, uh, the tools and you know, spreadsheets that allow you to kind of, again, regularly collect and process that data over and over again. You know, setting that up for the first time can be quite resource demanding, as I'm sure you all know. And in some cases, the data may not exist, in which case you have to um, set up those data collection, just, you know, data, data, raw data collection processes for the first time. So, you know, possibly, again, setting up new surveys uh, or new relationships with, with industry or um, you know, again, the, you know, other other providers of data. Um, and who who you know who typically are those providers of data? Um, obviously, you know, national statistical agencies and departments. You know, agricultural ministries um, are are kind of the the obvious one. It, um, but there may be data gaps. You know, there may not be complete complete national statistical data for everything that is needed for inventory. But there may be, you know, researchers at universities, either domestically or internationally, that might, might have done studies that could potentially supply data. Um, there's actually a wealth of information out there in the research literature on on things because people have studied most of these categories. Um, you know, studied, you know, livestock, studied um, fuel combustion. So there, there, um, there is data out there in many cases, but sometimes it can take time to find. Um, you know, where national statistics don't exist, you could also potentially contact industry directly uh, with, with a focus on, you know, industry associations as the first stop where they exist, because the industry associations are often already aggregating data across multiple companies. Um, um, there may be, you know, national laboratories or other, you know, specialized organizations or NGOs that are all already kind of working with industry or working with um, on a particular sector um, and, and beginning to make estimates and collect data. Again, they may not be estimating greenhouse gas emissions, but they may be estimating the activity data that you will need to estimate greenhouse gas emissions. 
um, permission factors and other guidance. Obviously, the IPCC guidelines um, is a key resource. Um, um, but an important point to, to make is um, for all of this, especially on your, your early inventories, um, expert judgment is oftentimes needed. For example, you may have fuel data, petrol, um, gasoline data for the country based on you know, imports, um, but you don't have any uh, source of data for what portion of that is used in ships versus um, cars versus trucks um, versus you know motorbikes um, and so it may require some expert judgment to say okay well we're, you know based on you know some preliminary information we have um, by you know some vehicle counts or some other things um, we're just going to make assumptions about what you know you know 80 percent is in is in automobiles and you know 10 percent is in motorbikes and, and so those kind of assumptions are, are, are okay to make as long as they're clearly documented and documented sort of what were the basis of them. And then that is linked to an inventory improvement um, plan for how we're going to, you know, get better data to, to, um, to refine that, that expert judgment. But the, the point is, is don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to make expert judgment and document it clearly. Um, and then, of course, there's other international organizations like the International Energy um, agency and other places that FAO that that have um, um, and UN agencies that that have international data that could be relied upon in some cases. Um, and, and looking at other inventories from other countries in your region, especially that may have developed uh, mission factors that are applicable in your context. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about the institutional arrangement. So that's kind of the, you know, that's the suppliers of the, the raw data. But then, of course, as I keep saying, um, there's the, you know, people have to have to do the work to get the data. Um, uh, it doesn't happen by itself. Um, and there's, you know, uh, uh, important to, you know, enhance and, and build up your legal framework for being able to be allowed to collect data and use it for the greenhouse gas inventory. Um, and, and put in place, you know, kind of, you know, formal um, um, institutional, you know, uh, uh, teams and, and, and uh, programs that, that um, you know, can, can implement those, those, those legal frameworks and, or, uh, um, as needed and uh, clearly assign responsibilities for who's in charge of what, um, uh, especially, of course, including data collection. Um, and then documenting all the procedures that each of those you know, institutions and staff members are, going, are in charge of with respect to data collection. So it's so there's no ambiguity about who's in charge of what. Um, and that's oftentimes what you know we see in some some countries is that um, you know there's there can be ambiguity around as the as the transition from you know relying on a consultant to develop um, the inventory and mass communication um, to bring that work within the government more. Um, sometimes there can be confusion and ambiguity about who's actually specifically in charge of what step within the process um, of collecting the data, of getting it into a data management system, of developing the estimates. So clearly making sure that those, those responsibilities are, are defined and accepted um, is a key process of institutional arrangement. And there's tools and templates for doing that that we, we will be able to go through um, um, in the workshop. Next slide. So, uh, you know, data collection basics, um, you know, some of the obvious things focus on key categories because um, um, they're, the, you know, the biggest, um, uh, you know, again, to find those procedures for data collection, um, you know, start with your national data because that should be the first, first place, you know, from national statistical agencies and other places. Um, um, Peer-reviewed research, you know, Peer-reviewed data from research, if you're relying on research data, it obviously is better than, you know, non-peer-reviewed data. Um, um, uh, direct data is better than sur surrogate. And so that means, for example, you know, if you do, if you can get data on, how, you know, on automobile fuel consumption separately, obviously do that rather than just, you know, guess it based on um, or estimate it based on, um, you know, uh, uh, assumption of, you know, how many cars are out there versus how many boats. Um, like these, these are common sense, right? Um, 
public data is better than confidential data. That's, you know, sometimes a rule of thumb. It's not always necessarily the case. It's sort of how you want to balance data quality versus data transparency. Um, and those are judgment calls that have to be made sometimes when you have multiple data sources. Um, if you can get conf you know, confidential data de directly from industry and it conflicts with possibly national statistical data, then you have to kind of think about how to address those, those sorts of issues um, uh, appropriately. Um, and those are usually you know, you know, careful internal conversations within, within the government. Next slide. So as I said, there's lots of, lots of other information that goes along with uh, uh, the data you have to uh, collect, like you know, when, you know, where it came from and when it was collected and when it was published, um, you know, a clear reference um, for where that data came from. Um, and ideally, even more than just the reference, you'd actually have a little bit of information about like, what was the process by which that data was collected because it could be you know, biases or problems with that data collection process. Um, um, in the first place that would affect your your understanding of uncertainty and whatnot, but and would also um, help uh, inform you um, of things that might be done in the future to improve the data collection. Um, obviously, who to contact and, uh, about, you know, in terms of the data supplier and in uh, reference to any procedures or data collection agreements you have. Um, um, caveats um, and assumptions that go along with that data, for example, it might as I mentioned before, you know, some data could be incomplete, meaning it may only be a survey of large um, facilities, um, you know, for example, cement, and they capture large cement facilities, but maybe miss a few small ones. Um, and then there has to be some expert judgment to fill in that gap for those small ones. Um, similar with like, you know, data from farms, you may miss some smaller farms. So how do we, how do we make the, you know, how do, how do we, you know, correct that data to address, you know, some, some incompleteness. Um, QAQC procedures. So there's a QAQC procedures that you yourself uh, as an inventory program apply, but there may be QAQC, QAQC procedures that the data supplier applies, you know, in, in, for example, a statistical agency already is applied to the data. And so understanding and documenting what those procedures are, are can be, is important. Um, any confidentiality restrictions that need to be applied to the data and then, of course, um, um, the process for which that data is archived um, um, needs to be considered up front. Next slide. So this is something I, I'm sure many of you are aware of. Um, um, uh, this all sounds good in terms of the, you know, the ideal process in terms of data collection and, and how you want it to work. Um, but there are oftentimes real barriers, you know, the barriers, you know, can be just data availability, you know, just limited data availability, in which case that's where the harder work, you know, comes into and in, in terms of like looking for other potential data sources, you know, there may be cases where you have, you know, um, several pieces of data, incomplete pieces of data, you know, maybe some national statistics that are sort of not exactly what you need and incomplete. And there may be some research data out there that's sort of, again, not exactly what you need, but incomplete. And there may be some international data from FAO that may be useful, but you don't think it is, you know, is, is, is as representative as you would like it to be. Um, and then how do you combine all these things together um, to, to actual, you know, one set of um, activity data that you're going to use for the inventory. And again, that's where you really have to, you know, bring in and bring in the, you know, technical experts, both you know, uh, nationally and potentially, you know, ask for assistance from, um, you know, international um, experts to make those expert judgment calls um, and, and figure out how to combine that data. And again, there's, there's some guidance in the IPCC guidelines on how to do this in terms of the data collection and gap filling processes and splicing and things like that. Um, there may, you know, barrier can be just simple technology. It may just be, you know, um, data may be in formats on paper that it's just hard, you know, hard to get to you. Um, and so there can be technological barriers um, involved. Um, uh, I'm sure all of you are familiar with that sometimes certain, uh, uh, you know, industry associations or even other ministries within the government might be reluctant to share data um, um, and so, you know, that's a process of you know, building trust and building relationships and, you know, building kind of formal ag agreements and maybe even set, again, going to that legal framework 
that sort of gets over those barriers. Um, next slide. So how does that, how, what does that look like in terms of getting, you know, building that trust and in, in, in overcoming some of the data sharing, um, I guess, uh, um, re resistance, um, you know, engage those, engage those data suppliers, you know, help them understand what you're doing, you know, why the national inventory is important, you know, what you're going to be using the data for, um, that um, you're, you're willing to cooperate with them. And as you develop estimates and, you know, and, and that, you know, start to uh, examine the data quality and uncertainty that you'll share that information back with them. Um, um, so that they can, you know, they'll get some value out of it. Um, and that you'll work with them, you know, on, on improving, you know, both the emission estimates, but also potentially improving their data. Um, and, you know, you know, setting up meetings and workshops where you invite them. So engaging those, those data supplier stakeholders in a process where they feel like they're important and valued. And then, of course, acknowledging them um, and giving them credit as a data supplier is, it, it can be very valuable. Um, but again, you know, this can take time and it's building relationships and, and, and building trust. Um, but it, uh, but if you're going to, you know, again, develop a long-term system of a long-term relationship of supplying data over and over again, um, it's, it's, it's important to do this upfront investment. Um, and there can be formal elements of this in, the, in addition to a legal framework, um, you know, in, in terms of, you know, data su supplier agreements, um, kind of clear procedure documents for, you know, for how the data is, is processed and transferred. Um, and different quality checks that happen along that along during that process. Um, obviously, there may be data security or confidentiality issues that 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 are of concern. Um, where you have just one or two companies that are you know supplying the data, and they want to be sure you know competitive issues are addressed. Um, uh, and then and then sort of again building that into a routine that happens over and over again. Next slide. And that is uh, all we have for uh, this part. Hopefully, I didn't go through that too too quickly. But again, the the key thing to to understand is we will be um, addressing all of this in more detail with exercises and and chances for um, much more discussion um, during the workshop. Uh, pass it back to you, Jimmy. Uh, Michael, thank you. Uh, may I suggest you to also introduce the last one? And then after that we can last slide. Then after that we can move to uh, Q and A. We already received a couple of questions, so if you can quickly introduce this homework, then we can uh, then switch to after that we can switch to Q and A. Sure, happy to. Um, so uh, all of you, um, um, either uh, Jigme, you may have to, uh, to, to assist me. What either have received or will soon receive. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, what? They received. Okay, so Errol, you are are, uh, are 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 you know hopefully now aware of uh, um, a homework assignment uh, that we've. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm I'm sure we all feel probably a little bit old to be um, um, uh, being out of school for some time to be given be given homework, but again, um, yeah, the 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 idea here is to make sure that the workshop we come to. Um, is as productive and helpful to you as possible. And, and a key part of that is all of us need to prepare um, to, to get as much out of it as, as possible. And so that's what, this, that's what this homework assignment is meant to do, uh, is to help facilitate that so that we can you know, use the time in person um, um, more effectively. So what we're you know, asking um, each, you know, everyone to do, or I should say requiring everyone to do, um, is uh, and there's you know hopefully clear instruction and you know be feel free to 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 to, to email um, email us uh, you know email the the secretary if you have any questions about the homework um, and we'll be happy to happy to assist but the you know the the process is as described on this this slide hopefully is and described in the instructions is hopefully pretty clear um, um, we're using you know picking one category um, we give a list of of a few options. Um, so, uh, source or removal category to, to kind of focus on as a, an example, you know, pick one that's sort of closest to, um, you know, your area of, of technical expertise, um, unless you want to, unless you want to just learn something about a new, new category, um, which, which is all, 
will be very useful. Um, and then, as I showed in that previous slide of kind of mapping the data flow, um, we want to uh, ask you to, to map the, the, for that, just for that one category, you know, your best understanding as for in your country of like how the data flows for that, like where it originally comes from, and then, you know, you know, the different, different steps along, um, you know, how it goes to where it finally ends up, you know, as in the hands of the, you know, you know, national inventory compiler, you know, for, for using a mission, mission essence. And again, this is just the, the raw data, the activity data and the mission factors for that category. Um, and then documenting the, the, the uh, and, you know, identifying the data sets that go along with that flow. So, you know, there may be a combination of you know, different sources. It could be the IPCC guidelines and mission factor database. It could be, you know, a database of, uh, um, you know, livestock uh, collected at, the, at, a, at a county or provincial level um, that then gets aggregated up um, for livestock data. Um, so documenting that. Um, and then there's a, a, also a brief question uh, in the homework. To, uh, now, once you've done that, then think about okay, you know, where in this in this map in this process are there are there gaps or are there challenges in terms of you know I'm not sure how this you know how this step in the data flow is going to happen yet or there's no there's no procedure here or there's you know we need an agreement you know to make sure this this step happens um, and so beginning to identify sort of where those where there's bar potential barriers or needs for improvement or needs for kind of you know refined procedures are. Um, um, and then, you know, submitting that to us as a, as a homework. Um, and I think you'll find this exercise um, very, very useful. Again, we're just, you know, requesting it or, or for one category. And then, but, you know, for the overall inventory, eventually you want, you, you know, we all need to do this for every category, you know, step by step. Did you lose Michael? Or? No. No, I'm still here. I'm sorry. I just, I did. So that, 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 that's all. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Uh, before we conclude, I will come back to this uh, how we uh, move uh, from now to workshop, and then I will also touch a bit on this homework. Uh, now let's uh, move to questions. Uh, I have. Uh, Received. We have received a couple of uh, questions, and we are uh, continuing to get uh, one. So let me read uh, first three uh, to you, Michael. Uh, the first question is: um, it, it was uh, on slide 24, which was about uh, greenhouse gas inventory, MRV information management, and there, within the uh, chart, uh, you had. Uh, mentioned small NAMA. So the question is, what uh, does uh, this mean, uh, small NAMA? It was under uh, project level. So that's the first question. And then a uh, second question was on slide 22, which was about a verification process. And then the question here is, is this process undertaken by uh, expert or experts certified by the UNFCCC uh, for the verification, what does the expert do to validate the greenhouse gas report? Third question is, uh, it's essentially seeking your uh, expert view here. Uh, if I now read the question, um, it says, we are in the process of installing a knowledge platform that will have a legal mandate to manage environmental information and data. But we are not sure if this will guarantee uh, data provision. What is your experience dealing with this? Um, yeah, so I think it's, it's more of your experience with um, uh, data uh, sharing um, by the uh, stakeholders here. So there's three questions, and then after that, we'll take a second. Michael, over to you. OK, thank you, Jigmi, and thank you for the questions. Um, small NAMAs, 
um, you know, nationally appropriate mitigation actions. Uh, I apologize if I didn't clarify that earlier. It was, a, you know, um, I, I, I won't I won't go into the historical origins of the NAMA concept. Um, um, although I'm sure I'm sure Jigme can can clarify it in in detail um, if if requested or needed. But um, you know, it's it's you know it was a, a you know a mechanism for um, you know su supporting um, uh, kind of a, you could almost think of it as somewhat of a predecessor to NDCs. Um, you know, supporting uh, you know national mitigation actions, um, put, you know, which could happen at multiple different scales. Um, it could be, you know, you know, one project at one facility, you know, which would be, you know, it could it could be a small facility, which would be a small NAMA, you know, one, you know, could be, you know, small renewable energy project or, um, or you know, retrofitting, a, um, a, you know, a landfill or something like that, you know, almost almost like a like a CDM project, or it could be, you know, something very large covering an entire sector, you know, the entire transportation sector, or or something like that, um, and in you know, any scale in between. So that was that was that was the point there was that um, you know NAMAs can be you know overall mitigation policies that address you know a large portion of the economy, or they could be really small that you know at a very, almost essentially at a project level, um, and, and run the you know run run across that scale. Um, so hopefully that clarifies that. Um, on verification, second question. Um, that's a that's a that's a, um, a a good one. So there's lots of different pieces. I mean, we use we use these terms kind of can be somewhat loosely verification, review, expert review, um, quality assurance, um, validation. Um, they 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 do have some, you know specific technical definitions in different contexts. Um, unfortunately, they don't always have the same definition you know across those contexts. Um, um, for example, you know, the common one is again the IPCC guidelines that I mentioned defines verification somewhat differently than, for example, the you know CDM and the carbon market does. Um, in that, um, you know, verification is um, under the IPCC guidelines is sort of you know developing and for an inventory estimate using you know independent data set um, from the you know the primary one that you're using for the inventory. Um, and they're comparing, you know, that that estimate, um, those two different estimates. Um, while verification, for example, in the carbon market, you know, is is kind of you know independent, you know, essentially kind of audit um, by by a verification body or verifier um, that follows certain procedures, you know, um, like again, like an like an auditor would. Um, and, and then, you know, of course, and then verification can have a different meaning within a purely scientific context as well. Um, and it also gets mixed in with for, you know, um, with validation, you know, which has a, also different meanings. You know, scientific scientifically you validate a model, but validation in the you know, again in the carbon market world is is you know an ex ante you know check of of a of a um, uh, you know project proposal. Um, so um, uh, and mixed in with that uh, is Obviously, the um, as it was, was mentioned in the question, the review process, um, you know, the expert expert review process that you know currently goes on for um, Annex One inventories, um, and then you know there's the you know other ICR and you know other processes that, um, um, the, you know, that are somewhat analogous, um, and th those can be seen, you know, they're quality assurance. I mean, that's that's the way I describe these. Like these are all different ways. Of assuring quality at different steps and you know in different ways, um, I and mean, the review process is another step that the you know the international community and the UNFCCC processes, um, you know, help assure quality and and you know assure trust. Um, and so, um, you know, countries oftentimes do cite and review you know the the re, you know the outputs of that review process as being part of their you know QA system. Um, so that would be, um, I know that was a, a long monologue, but as you can see, there's you know there's, there's lots of different F, you know aspects of it, um, um, and, and, and different different definitions are thrown out there. But I think the the so so you don't get confused. Um, the best 
thing to think of is just, you know, there's quality assurance and there's different ways you can do quality assurance. You can check the raw data. You can have some other peers review it. You can have, a, you know, UNFC triple C review team come in. You can develop independent estimates like the IPCC guidelines talks about. There's all these different things you can do and they're all relevant and valid um, aspects of overall quality assurance, verification, validation, review. Uh, you know, they're all part of that same, you know, overall purpose you're trying to achieve. And then lastly, um, knowledge platform, um, um, a guarantee of data provision. I guess this gets to the point I was trying to make and hopefully did um, in that, uh, you know, your data, data collection system, data management system really is what you want to think about. Um, is not just about the software tool. You know, obviously, as a, as a questioner pointed out, you know, there's, there's all those different elements I addressed. There's the you know, scientific knowledge, there's the legal framework, there's the institutional elements and the human resource elements of like, you know, you, know, you need, you know, a, a, again, a software program on a computer does no good if it doesn't have, you know, uh, institutions and people and staff that are actively using it and, and making, doing something with it. I'm in charge of it with clear, you know, responsibilities and 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 tasks to achieve, and 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 a and a kind of a mandate and a culture of you know continuous improvement and you know quality, you know developing quality outputs from it. So, um, I would say, um, you know, uh, it's it's easy to get easy to get sort of overly focused on I need a software tool or I need a, you know, uh, a, a data management tool and forget about these other, these other institutional aspects of things. Um, and, it, you know, to be honest, um, you know, you can, you can produce an inventory without any fancy knowledge management, you know, system. You can just, you know, you got the IPCC software, you know, putting together, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's templates out there or just, you know, developing your own, um, you know, simple spreadsheet just to get the data collected um, uh, and, you know, into, you know, in, in, into the IPC software. I mean, it doesn't need, it doesn't need to be overly sophisticated, you know, but, you know, it's those institutional arrangements for getting that work done that is, you know, oftentimes the most important, um, more so than the, than the tool. I'm not arguing that you don't need to invest in a tool, but, you know, a tool without without those other pieces is not very, it's not very effective. I mean, I can tell you from my own experiences, there were no tools out there when I, um, so, you know, my, my origin story, you might say is I developed the, the first U S the United States greenhouse gas inventory, um, too many years ago to talk about. Um, and, um, there were no tools or systems or spreadsheets. <laughs> um, we built it from scratch for the first time. Um, and that was that was largely what I spent several years of, of my early career doing, um, and um, so I mean uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't have to be you know overly complicated necessarily um, at least when you first start and then as you get more advanced of course you want more advanced tools, um, but 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 to start um, you know it is it is uh, you know thinking about the all those broader parts of the system that I talked about in the presentation I think is critical. Uh, okay, thank you, Michael. Is it on? Yeah. yeah, thank you, Michael. Uh, I have again a couple of more questions here. Uh, I'm reading through the questions. I, my my sense is that some of these questions might be uh, better addressed uh, in in workshop because I think this might uh, these questions might require a bit longer uh, discussion. Uh, so. There are a couple of them. I'm going to suggest that we uh, take note of this, and then we'll try to uh, revisit uh, them uh, during the in-person workshop. Uh, but there are a few others which are more of a technical clarification that I think we can uh, address it now. Uh, for example, there was a question which uh, was about uh, what means MOU. Uh, it uh, MOU is a, it, it is an acronym for a uh, memorandum of understanding. Uh, that's basically a official or legal arrangement captured in a semi uh, or, or legal uh, uh, document uh, between uh, two entities. And then uh, 
and then the other question was uh, on this idea of where will the continuous improvement plan go uh, under the enhanced transparency framework uh, now there is a requirement for uh, parties to uh, report a continuous improvement plan uh, my my understanding is um, that this will be um, this will be uh, this is something that will be further discussed under uh, subsidiary uh, body for uh, technology um, uh, advice uh, SAPSA, uh, as a part of discussion or negotiation on outline of uh, outline for uh, biennial uh, transparency uh, report so yes the the requirement is requirement obligation to report this information is confirmed in in COP24 but how and where is yet to be uh, uh, decided uh, and then um, there are three more uh, four more questions uh, there was a question about uh, if, if you can explain a bit uh, further on this expert judgment that I would suggest that we take it because this is one of the things that will be uh, taken up at the workshop so I think uh, we can park that for now the other two questions uh, other question that I would uh, park suggest uh, I would suggest that we park for now would be uh, what are the activities needed to make quality control effective for uh, data collection again this will be uh, um, covered or addressed uh, quite extensively in fact uh, during the workshop uh, now the two questions uh, for uh, Michael to address now would be uh, one on um, it, it relates to data gap the question here is what are the main methods for estimating gaps in data for first years of the time series for example uh, 1990 uh, to 1998 so essentially I think the key essence of this uh, question is what are the main uh, methodologies or approaches for uh, addressing gaps in data the second one it's um, it's basically um, comment plus question on your uh, one of the slides which which was on uh, barriers to data sharing uh, this thing um, the question here is um, it is not really straightforward to uh, identify or classify whether the uh, whether a data is publicly owned or not uh, because it can uh, sometimes be country specific so if if you can explain a bit more on what uh, what would be some of the parameters <coughs> or, or, or indicators that would allow uh, um, experts to uh, different distinguish between what is publicly owned and what is uh, what lies within a private domain so two questions to you Michael okay, okay. Um, I'll, I'll try and keep these these answers shorter <laughs> um, uh, data gaps I mean that that is a I mean especially as, as the questioner you know smartly pointed out you know going back to early years going back to 1990 I mean it's getting um, I, you know, um, I had the benefit when, when I was, you know, first developing inventories, uh, it, 1990 was not very, not very far into the past, <laughs> but, uh, you know, now it's getting, it's getting quite, quite back there. Um, and so, you know, finding data that, that far back in history is, 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 can be, can be a real challenge. And, and I think we all understand that. Um, I wish, I wish there was a, I wish there was some magic bullets, um, a magic method. Um, obviously, the IPCC guidelines has, has um, you know, uh, a whole chapter on this issue. Um, uh, you know, different techniques, different splicing techniques, different interpolation, extrapolation, and techniques. Um, you know, some other you know guidance on how to use surrogate data um, to to come up with estimates um, by surrogate. Um, you know, meaning kind of so other data sources that would be you know highly correlated with the with the you know. Typically, activity data that you're trying to trying to collect. Um, so you you know different economic indicators and things like that 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 would uh, um, that would be correlated with it that you could use as surrogate data. So there, there's a whole range of techniques. You know sometimes it comes down to expert judgment. Um, um, 
uh, there's, you know, uh, it goes, you know, it's actually a technique um, that we use in uncertainty analysis more, but there's um, structured um, expert elicitation, which is a very formalized way of, of extracting you know, quantitative uh, values from experts, um, from groups of experts um, to, to combine, you know, to, to, to come up with, you know, um, you know, values that don't don't necessarily actually exist, um, but but the experts can kind of use their use their experience to to quantify. So there there are a range of a range of you know techniques for doing that, and sometimes it may just be coming come down to, you know, just the individual inventory team, the inventory compilers, you know, own expert judgment. And again, it, you just have to, um, you know, clearly identify, you know, and, and document. That you know that, that you know those assumptions and you know that expert judgment was used and that this is not actual data. You know this is this is a judgment. Um, um, and then of course you know uh, you know classify the uncertainty of that accordingly. Um, it's obviously going to be higher and higher uncertainty. Um, again, those are those these are all things that we can go into um, um, you know in more detail in the, in, in the workshop. And the IPCC guidelines and does provide a lot of a lot of assistance on these on these topics. Um, so I can already tell I'm completely failing keeping my answer short. Um, and then lastly, on the um, barriers um, or uh, in the, you know, how to, you know, whether or not uh, I think the term was the data is publicly owned, and that's a, that's a great question. I mean, the the, the slide was really referring to um, whether or not data is 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 in the public domain, so publicly available, or whether data is um, you know, held confidentially, for example, by an industry, um, meaning not, you know, not in the public domain. Um, so, uh, you know, for example, cement plants have a lot of information about how they, you know, produce cement and how much cement they produce and clinker. Um, that data may or may not actually get shared publicly or with government. Um, there's a good reason why, you know, some industries do not, not want to share data because it's, you know, it has competitive value. Um, with you know their uh, other companies in, in their industry, um, so if it's not in that public domain, um, if it's not you know collected by government, then um, you know then you, there's you know other other issues involved like how do you get that you know company or industry to share that data and and what sort of what sort of you know measures do you need to put in place to give them you know give them confidence that, that you can be trusted to to, to handle that data, you know, confidential, confidentially and clear, and you know, and safely, so that it doesn't become a, you know, a competitive issue for them. Um, that was what the, you know, the, what the point there was talking about, and you know, that can obviously impact your ability to to get access to data. Now, whether or not data is publicly owned, um, you know, that's getting into um, that may be beyond the scope of what we can talk. Talk about here because you know that's more of an intellectual property, legal intellectual property um, um, question, um, which you know has implications implications here. But generally, um, um, you know, I'm <laughs> qualified. I'm not a lawyer, but um, um, generally, you know, the the use of this of the data that we're talking about here, producing a national inventory that gets is a you know formal government document. Um, and they get submitted to the UN. I mean, it's not a commercial use of data. Um, there's, you know, no one's, you know, no, you know, it's not being, it's not being sold for commercial purposes. Um, the national inventory estimates, um, and so the the intellectual property and data ownership issues are a little, you know, I guess less critical than it would be for, um, you know, for data that has commercial value necessarily. Although sometimes the input data to an inventory could have commercial value. Again, going back to you know, industry production data and things like that, you know, the, the, in some cases there are um, data suppliers. I mean, this is another issue we didn't really, I didn't really talk about, you know, there are, there are firms out there that, you know, estimate and, co and collect data and then resell it as a commercial business, you know, for investors and for, you know, primarily investors and analysts like that, that need to know, you know, they're going to, you know, trade stocks or, you know, do other things and they want to know sort of what the, you know, have projections of what's going to happen in the industry so they know what to make money on. So, you know, that is a potential other, you know, data supplier, you know, obviously those, those, those people charge money for their data. Um, and then there may be, you know, 
ownership issues about you know obviously they're not going to want didn't want you to make that data public you know make that data public so how would you deal with that issue it's not you know it would it would be it wouldn't be the first place i would i would look for 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 data collection is go to one of these you know commercial data suppliers i would i would try to try every other avenue i could find before i did that Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, well, this uh, brings us to the uh, end of the uh, session. Uh, let me, on behalf of uh, all the participants here, extend uh, our appreciation to uh, Canal and uh, Michael for exhaustively covering a um, uh, number of uh, range of issues. Uh, um, which which are very insightful. Uh, I think we should uh, actually they deserve a round of applause. Unfortunately, uh, all of us we are connecting uh, remotely from different places, so that's uh, uh, physically uh, not possible. But yet uh, we will give them a virtual round of applause. A <laughs> uh, couple of uh, question uh, information for you now. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we will circulate the updated uh, presentation, which you just saw. Uh, and then also, we have uh, recorded uh, the session, uh, and, and we will also make this uh, links available to you. Uh, the, uh, and and um, if time permits, uh, I would encourage you to uh, um, go through this recorded uh, session um, uh, during your free time. Um, uh, this is the first phase of the, this training uh, program. And then the, the second part of this would be uh, homework, which uh, Michael introduced. And again, um, we want to really make sure that the time that you would invest in, in coming to this in-person workshop really pays off and, and that you know this training program really helps you enhance your uh, uh, knowledge, um, uh, this thing. So we would really ask you to uh, invest a bit of uh, time on this homework. Uh, my, per my assessment, I don't think it should take uh, more than uh, 45 minutes at the most to do this exercise. And I would uh, ask you to uh, send us back this homework by 24th June, because then we will collect all this homeworks input from you, we will uh, process that and use that to further refine the workshop program that uh, we would be uh, putting uh, together. Uh, particularly, we would be basing uh, uh, quite a bit of, uh, to quite a, a bit of extent on, on how we design this hands-on exercises uh, for uh, this thing. And I can also uh, I can also finally um, uh, reconfirm that uh, we will be um, we will be um, getting deeper into most of these issues that uh, particularly the parts where Michael uh, just introduced. Uh, this is this webinar is going to be um, it's intended to be just intro to the. Uh, to the uh, workshop, so with the hope that uh, this will free up some time uh, at the workshop and, and, and use it for really hands-on and uh, interactive discussion. Uh, in meantime, if you have any uh, questions uh, on this presentation or, or, or if you have any expectation what you would uh, uh, what you would expect to be addressed at this workshop, please let us know. Um, the the point of contact would be uh, through this email that have been um, that you have been using for your travel arrangement or registration process, which is uh, t i s u at u uh, n f c c c dot in. So with that, uh, I wish I wish to express our deep uh, gratitude and thanks to all of you for uh, for uh, being with us uh, for last two uh, to the tune of two hours and uh, we look forward to welcoming you uh, in in Belize uh, in a month's time and finally uh, let me also acknowledge uh, presence of our 
esteemed CG member from uh, Cuba, uh, Mr. Luis Paz. I believe he is also following. Uh, he has been following this uh, discussion. So with that, thank you uh, once again, and have a good day.